What's going on, Cylinder Radio listeners? If you're interested in the nuance of dialogue and things like that, check out my freebie, download, Debate to Dialogue, How to Have Productive Conversations About Politics and Religion. Hello and welcome to the next episode of Cylinder Radio. I'm your host, Will Roosh, high school teacher in Los Angeles, trying to bring nuance to a whole myriad of, of different topics. And my guest today is someone I've uh, been in contact with a while um, on social media and stuff like that. Um, she and her husband do some um, really awesome things. It's a, uh, her, her social media is something that I, I highly recommend following, especially in like our Western civilized world and stuff like that. Cause she is a butcher, a farmer and a nutritionist. Uh, she has a really cool podcast called the mind, body and soil podcast, which, um, uh, I was even a guest on, you know, a little bit ago, uh, very cool stuff about, um, regenerative uh, agriculture and sustainable farming and all of that kind of stuff. So we're going to talk about food today. We're going to talk about uh, food and we're going to talk about how do we uh, maintain a healthy lifestyle ethically as much as we possibly can. I think this goes with my last podcast with Dr. Gary Schliffer and, and um, the importance of a good diet and everything like that. My guest is Kate Kavanaugh. Kate, it's so nice to see you um, uh, have this conversation. I've been wanting to have it for a long time. So I'm really glad that, that we're able to do it now because uh, I think there's a lot to get into. So thank you for so much for being here. Can you introduce yourself uh, yeah. to the audience without those who, who aren't familiar with you and what you do and all that? Well, kind of well, it's such a pleasure to be here. It's such an honor. I've been following your work for so many years. And so it feels really special to get to sit down with you and, and talk about agriculture and food. I think you did a great job introducing me. I, you know, to give people a little bit of background really quickly, I was a vegetarian for most of my life up until about age 20, when through some health problems, I decided I wanted to start eating meat again. And I am an all in kind of person. And so I went all in, in learning about regenerative agriculture. I have a background in biology and physical anthropology. So I went all in on learning about agriculture, both the industrial agricultural system that really dominates the landscape here in the United States and really over the world, and the alternatives, which regenerative agriculture, though at the time that I got into this, that wasn't the, the terminology that we mm. use. That's actually pretty new in the cultural yeah. lexicon. And I own a butcher shop in Denver, Colorado, and have been a butcher for over a decade. And like you said, my husband and I have a farm here where we raise and process all of our own meat uh, in a regenerative way. We do low polyunsaturated fatty acid pork and chicken and some sort of experimenting in regenerative agriculture. Yeah, it's it's cool. Here's the thing, though, is you say you're a butcher that has like um, a reaction in people. I mean, even me who, who you know, I've been a hunter and I've butchered animals not really very well. I'm usually just following one of my friends who's better at it. But uh, but it does spark the uh, the moral foundation of disgust. There's like an element of disgust yeah. there. And I was leaving for a, a hunting trip and I was telling my students and my student and I was telling them that I was a hunter and my students, these are 11th grade students in Los Angeles. So, you know, it's part of it, but maybe, but like they said, Mr. Rich, why don't you just go to the store to buy food so an animal mm. doesn't have to die? <laughs> I was like, wow, like, they're so separate. They're used to their chicken being in a nugget form, breaded in a plastic bag yes. with all kinds of stuff on it. Like we have been so removed from the process of food and animals and, um, and the process of, of how we get nutrition and stuff like that. It's really yes. interesting how that's coming. You are face to face with it daily. So what, what is that like? Like, what is, can you bring us into what that's like a little bit? Cause even myself, like I mostly buy my food from like a butcher shop. We have a local butcher, butcher shop here or from the grocery store or something like that. I am very removed from the whole process of growing from a seed to a plant or raising an animal and then killing it. And like the process of like, you're, yeah, yeah you're, you're taking life and all of that kind of stuff that yeah. you are confronted with. And we have our blinders on in society so often. We do. And I think you bring up a really important point, which is we've We've, we are disconnected from this right now, but from a historical perspective, humans have been involved in raising, hunting, slaughtering, and processing their own food for many, many millennia throughout human history. You could even make the argument that that process, that relationship that we have with our food is a part of what makes us human. And it's really been within the last 150 years that we have become deeply disconnected 
from it. And I think more so since since World War II. And even at World War II, most people would have had chickens in their backyard. They would have grown a small victory garden and they would have had knowledge of what those processes of raising and growing their own food looked like. And I think in addition to having this concept where we get these hermetically sealed packages of food at the grocery store where we, we don't have a connection point to where they came from, we also are very disconnected from death. And one of the perspectives that I've taken on this, and, and I mean throughout not just our food system, but within our culture, this is death happens in hospice, it happens behind hospital walls, it used to happen at home, we used to do funerals at home, I just had a lovely woman where we talked about home funerals on the podcast, and this aspect of bringing death home, because in many ways, we outsource death. And when we're talking about eating food, we are absolutely talking about outsourcing death to a very few amount of individuals within the industrial food system, where you have these massive slaughterhouses that process between 15 and 20,000 animals per day. And there are going to be very few individuals that are responsible for that act of killing. And so we're disconnected in all of these different ways. And Part of what has driven my story is a desire to be more deeply connected in life, but also with this aspect of my food. And I think that one of the things I like to say at the outset is that the act of eating is incredibly intimate. And there are very few things, we put this inside of our body two, three times a day. And what is outside of our body, right? Our digestive tract is continuous with our skin and with the boundary that we consider self. And when we chew our food and digest it, the elements and matter that make up our food actually diffuse across a one cell wall thick membrane in our digestive tract and they become us. They become part of what we view as self. And this is an incredibly intimate act. And I think that that is, it is part of what has made us human is this conversation between our biology and our environment through the vehicle that is food. And I wanted to increase that sense of connection and intimacy. I love you are what you eat. You are what you eat. Absolutely. <laughs> like, yeah. And um, and it is a constant process of becoming, even, even in breath, right? The carbon dioxide that we exhale becomes plant tissues. Oxygen becomes part of our tissues. And so there is this reciprocity in all of eating, breathing, and life. Yeah. When you say connected to life, I think something that you're touching on, Kate, that's really important and it's uncomfortable, but beautiful is life is the yin yang. It's the it's, it's, it's the good and the bad. It's the ugliness too. Like we outsource stuff with our food and the killing, but we also outsource garbage. We outsource yes. sewage. I mean, yes. all this stuff, like, like you step on some dog poop wearing a shoe and you're like, Oh my gosh, disgusted. Cause we're so far removed from animal waste and garbage. You just put it in the bin. You put it out at the curb and it goes somewhere. And let me remind you yeah. really quickly, there is no waste in nature. Everything in nature is part of recycling. It's part of decay back into rebirth, back into life. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this it's like these like tropes, like, you know, I watched like the Lion King with my kids. It's like, yeah, there's something to that, that circle of life stuff. Like yeah, <laughs> yeah. matter cannot be created nor destroyed, like all of that kind of stuff. Exactly. And yet because we live this life that's so um, comfortable and we've anything that's unpleasant, we, we remove and then. I don't know. What do you think? This is getting a little out there, but like, do you think that that has something to do with, maybe this is a leap, me like going to my social mm -hmm. science brain, but it has something to do with the anti-fragility, you know, like the, the, the fragileness of, of so many people, young people, especially today is because they're not confronted with this kind of stuff. So they think that they're becoming more comfortable, but kind of by definition, when you're very, very, very comfortable all the time, then what seems uncomfortable will get smaller and smaller and smaller, like a, like a micro you know, whatever it is. Do you think that that's connected? Do you have like elements of that? Yeah. Oh, yes. I think that this yeah. is connected both to our, our fragility. And I think that that part of the anti-fragile story is the story of being connected and being part of nature and having these uncomfortable feedback loops where you're a little bit too hot, you're a little bit too yeah. cold, that the act of death and killing animals is 
not easy, but it brings us closer, right? And you said this, there's the yin yang, that death is the perigee to the apogee of life. And I think that that discomfort, grief, is essential to what it is to experience joy. And I think that it absolutely has sort of inculcated us in this very protective environment where we're not getting this chance to connect and to stretch. But I also think it's left us with a bit of a void. If we think that, you know, over the last 3 million years of human evolution, that food has been what we spent most of our time doing, I think that some of the some of the mental illness we see, some of the depression we see is indicative of that lack of a feeling connected to something. And this could be a lot of different things. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I just think it makes sense. The way I try to explain it to my students sometimes is like, your car, take any machine. It was designed for something. It was designed to run on gasoline. You can't just put, you know, diesel in a gasoline car, or you can't just, you know, put you know, you know, just like like baking soda or something like that, or water, like it's not going to work. It's designed to run a certain way, and I think people have evolved to be a certain way and to run on certain products and, um, uh, you know, certain things for nutrition, and also to, to be around the 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 whole spectrum of what life is. And when you yes. eliminate that, your body. Your, your, your mind and your body go, all right, well, we need to struggle for something. Um, you know, what is deemed a threat? You know, what is that prevalence induced concept change? Like what is, mm -hmm. seems like a threat is becoming smaller and smaller and smaller. And that's just going to riddle you with fear because things we're, we're in a very safe society. Most of us in a large part in 2023, but it seems like there's threats looming everywhere because you don't have as many, like whatever, quote unquote, real threats, you know? Yes. Absolutely. Um, and I think fear yeah. disconnects. When we're yeah. talking about fear, we're talking about something that is an agent of disconnection. Yeah. So one of the things um, that I want to go into first, and then I want to go in the nutrition side too, because you know that as well. Like, But factory farming is something that uh, I think is going to be looked back in a couple generations, maybe, I hope. They're going to look back and, and we're going to go, oh my gosh, I can't believe what we did with factory farming. Uh, I actually made a video a couple of years ago comparing factory farming to slavery, not saying it's the same thing or I get canceled again, but like it's uh, <laughs> just saying like the context of history is, you know, when they wanted to eliminate slavery, it was like, you know, factory, fa factory workers in the North. And it's like in the South, like easy for you to say, like, this is how we make our living. This is how we provide for our family. We just can't, we can't eliminate this, this whole thing that our economy is based on. Um, <laughs> And it turns out not to be true, but that's kind of the thing with factory farming is like, how do we feed all these people? We need these massive industrial farms. Mm -hmm. And when I say that they're, you know, terrible or important, like it's really bad what goes on there. Um, talk a little bit before we start recording, like there's like these gag orders where journalists, I don't know the details of it, but like journalists aren't allowed to go into these big, you know, whatever Purdue farms or these big, uh, massive, massive warehouses that are just filled with tons of animals being slaughtered and stuff like that. They can't film there. So I guess it's the lobbying power. Uh, so with those videos you see from PETA and things like that, those are all smuggled in and they're all, you know, hidden camera and stuff, but they are, they are pumping these animals full of all kinds of chemicals to get them as big as possible. And they, they torture them. They keep them in very confined spaces and stuff like that. Horrible, horrible lives. And then they slaughter them, but then also like all the animal waste, they put them into these like, and uh, you can expand on this, but like they put them in these like, yeah. yeah, these like ponds or whatever. And then a lot of them, they aerosol it and the air, they aerosol the waste and it goes into the, the air of like neighboring communities, which are going to be poor communities. And those communities like breathe in all this toxic, you know, waste and stuff. It's really, really terrible. But again, most people don't know that they just know they have chicken nuggets or a cheeseburger. They don't know what's going into having to scale our food system the way that it is. And factory farming is something that I think we're going to look back on and go, Oh my gosh, that was terrible. But how to get over that is, is, is a, something I guess we'll, we'll have to touch on, but like, what are your thoughts on, on factory farming and how that is different than like what you guys do? Yeah. So I want to mention that all of this obfuscation is by design, that it doesn't behoove that system to be transparent about their practices yeah. and to show the ways in which they raise animals. And, you know, the rise of factory farming is 
it, it coincides with the rise of, of yields and the basis for synthetic fertilizer and being able to grow a lot more food. During World War II, we had this idea that we were going to feed the world. And when World War II ended, we were left with a lot of extra grain and a lot of extra food. And that actually ended up getting utilized in livestock systems as feed. It's not the first instance of feeding grain to animals. And I want to clarify here. Here, right, we're talking about two different types of animals. There's monogastric animals, which are going to be pigs and chickens. They have a single stomach like us. Pigs have very similar digestion, chickens a little bit less so. And then there are ruminants, and these are animals like cattle, bison, elk, deer, and they have a four-chambered stomach that it has co-evolved with grasslands to digest grass. And so within those systems, they began feeding grain and realizing that they could increase their yields in very quickly. And this really gained steam. And in the 1970s, the Secretary of Agriculture under Nixon, Earl Butts, said, get big or get out. And this is a pretty famous phrase, and it was really talking about the industrialization of agriculture, the concentration of farming from small farms to really big outfits that became or were at the time part of corporations. And in that sort of, it's what my friend Anthony Gustin calls the corporate organism. It's almost this emergent property of human consciousness where everything is in service to the bottom line. And so in that you want animals to, you want to use as little space as possible to grow animals as quickly as possible with very little consideration for the ramifications either for animal welfare or for human health or for land health. And this is where we really are in this system is this in service to the bottom line. And there are a lot of things that you have to import, right? You are importing fertility. You are importing all of this feed and growing all of this feed for livestock. You are using chemicals and pharmaceuticals in order to keep these livestock healthy and to make them grow faster. And you are really just creating a product that that does not confer health for anyone and and just makes a lot of money. Yeah, and this gets like tinfoil haddish, but it's not. Because if I have my class kind of like recite back and forth all the time, like the job of a corporation is to raise shareholder value. So it's not the individuals who work for corporations have morality and stuff, but the, the corporation itself is just to make money to raise shareholder value. So whatever you got to do to do that, you do that. That's that's its one focus. It's like a shark just swims and eats, you know, whatever they say in Jaws. Like that's what a corporation does is it grows that that kind of revenue. So, yeah, they're not concerned about health. Pharmaceutical companies aren't concerned about making you healthy. They're concerned about selling drugs and same with food yes. companies. And that's just obvious. That's what, ha that's what, that's the goal. And that just needs to be buttressed by, by something else. Like that needs to be like, you know, regulatory agencies or something like that need to go, okay, hold it up. That's the only way that this capitalist system works is if it's being regulated and it doesn't seem to be. Or if the alternative is being incentivized. Yeah. That is, is important too. If the yeah. alternative is incentivized and can be profitable, then that also changes the system. So that's what you, so how, how do you incentivize something better? I think this is a good question. And I think right now there are some perverse incentives within the industrial agricultural system, one of which being subsidies. We subsidize so much of the grain that these animals eat, corn and soy, and you have I mean, the pharmaceutical companies involved, something like 85% of antibiotics produced in the world goes directly to livestock, not to human use, which creates a lot of downstream ramifications. Yeah. And so when you have something that is incentivizing growing and raising corn and soy in a conventional way that is destroying landscapes, right? We've lost over half of our topsoil endowment in the last 200 years. We lose between 20 and 70 billion tons of topsoil each year because of the way this industrial grain production functions. It's like monocrop agriculture stuff? Yes, this is monocropped okay. agriculture. So just miles and miles of corn and miles and miles of soy that are mostly for animal feeds and also ethanol. And 
so we would have to create incentives for building topsoil. And this would look like including things like cover crops in the rotation of some of these grains. It would look like shifting towards 100% grass-fed and grass-finished ruminants and having that fetch a, a better price, therefore incentivizing raising them that way. Most of the cattle in this country is raised on grass for the majority of its life and then finished on a feedlot for a certain number of days. And I think it means reducing some of our consumption of pork and chicken, which even in my experience here on the farm are incredibly hard to raise without all of these big grain inputs. Yeah. Um so, yeah, I'm with you. Like, but like, again, how do we, so the subsidies are going uh, like for corn and stuff to make high fructose corn syrup and all this feed and stuff like that. Is that just through lobbying? Is that, does that go back to these companies have a, enough money to send a whole bunch of people to Washington to yes. wine and dine and connect people? And a lot of people watching are like, I don't know anything about anything. Oh, well, we need, we need corn to feed our population. Then we got to, I mean, is it that, is it access? Cause the rich are the ones who have access. So then they can get the lobbyists and then small independent farmers like yourself. You don't have like, you like millions of dollars potentially nope. to spend on lobbyists. That's correct. I mean, it's lobbying. It's part of what gets, gets put into the farm bill. We have another farm bill coming through, I think this fall. And it, it really is just that trickle down from corporations and the alternative system, right? A decentralized system where you have different size players, you know, micro, small, medium, and even larger farmers, distributors, processors, and aggregators, which are also an important part of the system that are working together outside of that corporate system to build a food system that is healthy for both land and bodies. Yeah. Like, I guess the issue comes down to scale. And it's something that I talk about a lot because in education, like I'm, I'm bad at most things, <laughs> but I'm good at being a classroom teacher. You put me in a classroom with almost any kind of topic, especially in social studies. Like I can teach, I can, I can do it really well, but I only get access to, you know, 25 students, you know, times four classes or five classes, you know, every year, that's a hundred kids. Like, how do I scale that to be, to teach a hundred thousand? If I am good at it, I should be teaching a bunch of kids, not just at my one school. I was talking about that with, with, uh, uh, Dr. Schliffer, like, how do you scale good, um, uh, medical care? It's very hard. And how do very you hard. scale, like, how do you scale like small ethical farming to meet this whole population. I think that's a, that's a, a big argument of a lot of vegans is like the only way that we can scale to feed everybody in a, in a humane mm -hmm. way to get rid of factory farming is through a vegan, which has its own issues, but like, yeah. but, but I mean, is it lab grown meat or something? Can, can we scale what you do to, to feed the whole population? Cause we can't hunt. Like not everyone can go hunting. I think hunting's great, but like, can, how do we scale this ethical kind of farming that you do, that's awesome, but it is kind of like a Rolls Royce. It is kind of, not, not in that it's expensive, it's maybe more expensive a little bit, but like, it's just, it's, it's, it's so time consuming. It's so focused and it does require more land and all that kind of stuff. So yeah. can we scale it? Let me, let me talk about a couple of things. Please, so number yeah. one, I don't think that there is such thing as a deathless diet. Death is inherent to what it means to grow food. So when you're looking at the vegan alternative and you're looking at growing crops of pea protein in order to service a Beyond Burger and rapeseed for the canola oil, you are still looking at monocropped agriculture that destroys biodiversity, which is life. And there is death baked into that in small mammalian life that dies in combine harvesters, wildlife that gets displaced. You're looking at the death of one billion, right? Uh, inside of soil, you have 1 billion microorganisms per teaspoon. So if you have topsoil erosion, you have death of all of this microbial, bacterial, fungal, uh, fungal life inside of the soil. Um, we can kind of get into lab grown meat, but let's talk about scaling because I think that this is a really important question. Can we scale regenerative mm -hmm. agriculture? And I, I do think that we can, and I think it is a worthy effort to at the minimum try. 
And I think that when you look at the fact that 40% of the world is covered in land that is not suited to growing crops, but is suited to grazing livestock, then all of a sudden we have an opportunity there. And not only is it suited to grazing livestock, but most of this land, these grasslands co-evolved with ruminants, where you have a symbiotic relationship between the ruminant and between the grasslands where they are conferring health to one another. And you see this, for example, the United States used to be 40% prairie. On that prairie were over 100 million ruminants, bison, elk, pronghorn, and they evolved with those grasslands to fertilize them with their urine and manure, to push seeds into the soil with their feet and to graze them and then move in a cyclical and seasonal pattern that helped create root resilience as they'd take one or two bites off the plant and those roots would become stronger, less fragile, if you will. And then they would move on and come back. And that was part of what built the amazing fertility and topsoil that we think of as the bread belt today, where we grow corn and soy. And so these animals have a symbiotic relationship. And with 40% of the world not being suitable to growing crops, this is a huge opportunity to grow an incredibly nutrient dense food. And I want to add this in there, the bioavailability of the nutrients within meat is far outnumbers that of, of beans or of broccoli or of lentils and gives us nutrition that we also co-evolved with, that our bodies co-evolved with meat. And I think in terms of scalability, we have to give it a shot. And there's a gentleman in Georgia named Will Harris. He's a very well-known regenerative agriculture guy. He's been on my podcast. He's been on Rogan. He's been on all the big outfits. And he has really built a much larger system down there. He is doing about $25 million per year and has uh, thousands of acres of a biodiverse group of species where he is actually, they just did a life cycle analysis where they showed that he was sequestering more carbon than he was putting out. I think that's a, a sort of narrow view of a metric, but I do think that it's possible to scale and it's not all going to be teeny tiny farms like mine. There are going to be some bigger outfits. There are going to be aggregators like Force of Nature meats that pulls from multiple regenerative farms to, to put meat in the grocery store. And so this isn't just about teeny tiny farms. It's about all of us working together and finding systems that aren't replicatable per se, but are suited to the environment that they're in. So what Will is doing in Georgia isn't what I'm going to be doing in New York. And so we have to think about place in this as well. Yeah. Um, well, that's, that's gives you some optimism because I didn't know, I didn't know some of the, some of that information. I didn't know that it even would be possible. It seems like it is. I think what we have to do is just be willing to shift like the way that we do food. But that's, yes. I mean, like we have, here's the thing is like, we're not doing well guys like in America, yeah. like we're not doing well when it comes to food. Like if you look at like obesity and health issues and stuff like that, the life expectancy is now falling, even though there's more information than ever. Yeah. Like you listen to like, you know, Huberman or whoever, like you listen to all these people, like the, there's a lot of information on how to be healthy, but people just don't. And, and it's, it's just, it's why would you adopt something that makes your life a little bit more difficult? And a little bit and open your eyes up a little bit more, like you said, to like, oh, this was once an animal and this, you know, had, you know, eyes and it had parents or whatever it is. Like, like it's it's you have to shift things. And I feel like it's almost like when um people become are addicts, they don't give up their addiction until the pain of giving it up mm -hmm. is less than the pain of staying there. They almost have to hit like a rock bottom. And I worry that a lot of the changes that that we need as a society aren't gonna come until it's like really bad. So I have this, I wanna run this by you and it'll be quick. Yeah. I have this idea that cooking actually sits the, at the heart of three major problems in our culture. Okay. It sits at the heart of health. If we cook more food at home, that is, it, it is just naturally, instead of processed food, instead of going out to eat, you know, that is going to confer more health. It sits at agriculture, 
right? We really need people to support regenerative agriculture. It actually needs scale in order to be successful. And farmers operate generally on one and a half percent margins. So that direct to consumer connection makes a really big difference mm -hmm. in supporting this alternative system. And it brings us together as a community, both in terms of that connection between farmer and consumer, in terms of eating with our families and our friends at the dinner table. And yeah. there in the middle is cooking. Yeah. And people just have to be willing to recognize that they're not doing well and then be willing to do the uncomfortable things to move yes. there. And when you do, when you start to ad adopt like a lifestyle that's more connected with food and cooking and knowing what's going into everything and looking at ingredients and things like that, mm -hmm. you do feel better. Like you do, yes. people just want to take a pill and make themselves feel better. But like, it takes some time guys. Like it takes some time. It's like the matrix where they just flutter their eyeballs and all of a sudden they can fly a helicopter. It's like, you can learn how to fly a helicopter. You just you got to put in some work. It's going to take some time, but you can you just have to be willing to put in that time. I think that this kind of sits in a similar space. Yes and no. It takes time, but for the most part, you can reverse diabetes within two to four weeks eating a whole foods diet. I know yeah. people that have reversed horrible ulcerative colitis within two weeks of eating a carnivore diet, which I don't think is for everyone. But yes, it takes time and it does take effort, but arguably not that much time. And I really believe that there is a lot of addition by subtraction, that we, when we subtract some of these things out of our diet, we are gaining mental clarity. We are gaining energy to live our lives and to go out there and to be with our families in a deeper and more meaningful way and to go after our big dreams. And I think that that is a worthwhile pursuit and it's worth me feeling good. Yeah. It's just people don't, don't do it. Like there's so many people that know they're eating terribly. They watch the scale continue to go up. They watch their health problems get worse. And yeah, I mean, you know, just adopting a more whatever, like, uh, like paleo or more animal based uh, diet sorry, um, will, will reverse it. it will, it will, it'll make a difference that you'll feel very quickly, but just like even just a day or two of not eating, you know, a ton of, you know, white bread and stuff like that. It's, it's yeah. disorienting for a lot of people. Uh, one of the things you mentioned about uh, uh, like the vegan or like monocrop agricultural like kind of mm -hmm. um, thing is the animals that die in that process. The topsoil one is really serious and dropping like that information about like how much topsoil gets lost. And people don't understand how 20 important to 70 that is. billion tons per that's, year. That's nuts. Yeah. yeah. Um, the, the, one of the things that is like, I heard that too, that a lot of animals die with the combines ripping through. And mm -hmm. I actually had a, a a girl in my class this is years ago who was uh her family owned um farm property and i was like is that true and she's like i don't know so uh, in class she like got on her phone and called her mom and they talked to like the, the guys who run the combines and they're like oh yeah like oh, gulls yeah. and all kinds of birds just like circle the combines just rip up all the the rabbits and mice and yep. voles and all yep. that kind of stuff and one of the questions i have i've been trying to get a vegan on my on my podcast for a while and they're not willing to come on and i'm like trying it's so interesting <laughs> Um, but one of the, I have a question about like, you know, why is the value of a cow's life more valuable than a mouse, than a mouse's, you know, like where, if you, if it's life, then, then how do you do that? And for someone who has slaughtered a lot of animals, do you see a difference? Cause I've killed like, mm. you know, like doves or like pheasants or something like that, but then also deer. And I guess I do feel more connected to like a bigger animal. Mm -hmm. Cause it's just like, I don't know. It feels more human to some degree compared to like, I'll, I'll mm. like crush a, a wasp that's in my house or something like that. It's like, that's, a, that's not me at all. Um, but I don't know how that works. Like, do you, do you feel like um, a difference when an animal dies? That's like more, I guess has like more human characteristics, I guess, or something like that compared to like a chicken. It's kind of a goofy question, but it's not a goofy question at all. And I think it's actually a really important question. And I think because we view stuff in such a linear way, we also view things in a very hierarchical way. Yeah. And I think we can trace back linear thinking, maybe to agriculture, but also to the science of Descartes and Newton. And we see this break in cyclical thinking, which we really get when we spend time in nature, which is ruled by the cycles of the seasons and the cycle of the moon and this life, death and rebirth cycle. And I think that that really plays into the social view of looking at everything as a hierarchy, everything as a race, everything as a yeah. competition. 
And I think that there's this beautiful biologist and philosopher named Dr. Andreas Weber that I just interviewed. And we see ourselves in other beings. The way that we yeah. define our internal experience so often relates back to what we see in the natural world. And it's important that I say that we are a part of the natural world. They are inseparable. It's nature, the environment is not out there. It's also right here. But when we talk about feeling like our career is in bloom, that is a reference to a flower. Or we talk about a freeze response. That is something that we witness when we see ice. And we, little kids, right? Little kids, one of the first things they reach for are dogs and cats and just this deep desire. And one of the most interesting things is we define every every rollover, every mark of tummy time and developmental milestone, we don't talk about when we start looking at other creatures because it is in other creatures that we see the reflection of ourselves. And I think that because we need to know nature, to know self, that we give some of these larger mammals that feel closer to our own biology, this hierarchical view. And I think that that makes sense. And I think that that's just going to be part of human nature. And I think within my own experience, there is a little bit more heaviness when I am processing, when I am slaughtering, when I am killing our goats, when I am killing a cow versus when I am killing a chicken. But it all weighs heavy and and it is part of being in reality and being in deep connection with something. And it is part of being a predator. And Homo sapien sapien is, by nature, a predator. And it is also part of being a part of the cycles of stewarding life. And if I'm here on this farm practicing regenerative agriculture, this is part of that. If you are out hunting deer and controlling populations because we no longer have predators like wolves and bears in the number that we used to, you, that is part of you being part of the ecosystem. And it comes with a lot of complicated feelings. I can feel sad to lose an animal that I've spent the last two, three, four years with, and I can feel a sense of accomplishment and joy at filling my freezer and my family. This can be complex. It can have nuance. Yeah. I mean, there's so much to that. Like it's when people are get really upset with like something when it comes to, you know, killing animals or something, they're looking at one little piece of the full puzzle. Like you said, like the full kind of human experience and stuff like that. Like, you know, killing, you know, how, how do you kill the animals? Do you guys on your farm? I mean, it depends. So we always stun an animal first, which means that you are either going to use a bullet or a knife to sever the central nervous system so they are no longer present mentally mm. in that body. Yeah. And so with a pig or a cow, you're going to shoot them in the forehead. That's going to stun them. What they actually die of is exsanguination. So you're going to cut the jugular. You use like a like a like a hand like a handgun or a rifle. Yeah, or we use a handgun. Yeah, depends on what it is. Sometimes it's a rifle. If it's a cow, it's yeah. a rifle. If it's a pig, it's a handgun. If it's a goat, yeah. it's a handgun. Um, and then we cut the jugular and they bleed out. And I think it's worth noting here that we really view our, our bodies as one, right? This is one self, yeah. but in truth, the bacteria and fungi and yeast and protozoa on our bodies outnumber our own DNA. And when death happens, it is part of what nourishes life. So there's both the proliferation of that bacterial and fungal life that is on that body that suddenly, now that there is no more self-creating system there, goes rogue and begins to consume that. But all of that goes back to the soil too. And when we talk about synthetic fertilizer, we're talking about nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, NPK. Well, your blood is rich in nitrogen, your bones are rich in phosphorus, and your tissues are rich in potassium. And so that is part of what is nourishing the next cycle of life. And I really view death as the transformation of one into many. And that happens too with the meat that feeds my husband and I. Yeah, like when you talk about this, like to some people listening, they'd be like, just shoot an animal in the head. Like, oh, 
like they're so ignorance is not virtuous though. And I think that, that, that saying I'm going to eat a cheeseburger. I don't, I don't kill anything though. It's like, how do you think animals die in the wild too? When you say like you raise these animals and then you kill them like, or I shoot, I shoot a, a deer or something like that. Like they're not, and they don't die in a warm bed surrounded by loved ones. Like it's, it's a, it's a harsh way to die and getting shot in the head is as like, good as it gets for an animal. As it gets. Like, we're all headed. We're all headed for death guys. So like yeah. to go quickly when you have no idea and stuff like that, but and it's really, that it's death really, is outsourced, right? Yeah, like you're just outsourcing yeah. somebody else killing that animal. And I mean, nature is brutal. Those deer are often starving if they're oh not being gosh. hunted. Yeah, and that is, that is a tough death. Or, yeah. yeah. Oh my gosh. But Jordan Peterson says something that's really good. He said, when you um, abdicate responsibility, you invite tyranny. And I think mm. that what happens is we're so unwilling to do what you just described, yeah. what you do on a daily basis, that we invite corporations to do that dirty work yes. for us. And that's how we get there is because it rides on us is our yes. unwillingness to go out and do the things that you do every day. I did not going to say you have to do, you're choosing to do it, but yes. you're choosing to do that because you don't want someone to do it. And it is way worse. The way that your the life from, from birth to death of the animals on your farm is objectively better by anyone who chooses to look at it than the life of an animal at some big, you know, corporate factory farm. It just, it, it just is. So same and, and it's a similar thing with hunting, like an animal that lives in the wild and stuff, like a little bit more brutal, but like it's not confined and abused its whole life. So that's just something that that really uh, stands out is that 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 reality that if, if you go, oh, that's terrible, I could never do that. Well, someone's going to do it and they're probably not going to do it in a kind way because I'm sure I mean, am I, maybe I'm just projecting on you, Kate, but like, I'm sure you don't feel great when you kill these animals. Like, you have a, an, an element of like, this is sad yes and. absolutely yeah right sad and it's sad yeah. and and we are capable yeah. of holding that level of complexity it's sad it's heavy both my husband and i usually feel tired afterwards it yeah. it has a certain weight and i think you know within any hunter gatherer society that we would have only killed maybe an animal a day and that would have been shared amongst individuals in the group and it's an important rite of passage. And again, it's an important benchmark for all the rest of life to experience and be intimate with death. Yeah, it's kind of weird to do this like toward the end of the podcast, but how did you get like this, Kate? You're a fascinating person. Like you're really brilliant when it comes to like understanding this because like, I see that it's your passion and stuff, but you're also like, you guys are hardcore. Like the way you just like, you, you have, you know, the insides of the bodies and you'll kill things and you'll like, you get your hands dirty, you're out in the cold. like. Did you, were you raised around this or is this something no. that you, this is something that you adopted later in life? Yeah. And Kia, can you yeah. just like, so, so I should have done this at the beginning, but um, like, how did you end up here? It's very yeah. interesting. I really think that it was about looking for connection. So as a kid, right, I was a vegetarian and I was very death averse. Um, I was very aware of death at a young age. There was a lot of death in my household and a lot of talk about death. And I really felt that I could control this thing. And I think a lot of us feel that way, right? That by removing this choice from the food system that we can control this thing that we're very afraid of because it's very much not a part of our lives. And I also, uh, as a little kid, I had a lot of troubles connecting with my peers, with adults. I, I just had a lot of troubles. I was a very isolated little kid and I was seeking connection. And I think that has really driven me in my life to seek deeper and deeper connection when I find something that feels deeply real. And I am also a, I, I am also a little bit obsessive, right? I, I take on these sort of special interests and I want to know absolutely everything about them. Bring that to the podcast too. And wanting to be all the way in and wanting to be as close as possible to the beating heart of what I consider this reality. And, and that has been at 
my own discomfort and wanting to be uncomfortable. I do not want to live a comfortable life. I want to be back into that space where I am a part of the cyclical aspect of nature that is too hot and too cold and too sad and too hard and also wow. so beautiful. That's amazing, Kate. Like, yeah, I mean, people do that because they're like, I'm going to do a hard thing. I'm going to do burpees at the gym, which is uncomfortable. But for people who are gym rats, it's actually not they're like, oh, you know, you got to get uncomfortable. <laughs> it's like, how uncomfortable is it really for David Goggins to run right now? You know, like, you know, you, I think it was, but like, I think you know, it was, I was about to say, I mean, you just fixed that knee. I think, it, yeah. I think it was pretty uncomfortable. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I know I love Goggins, but like, but I think that, you know, the way that you did it is different than like the more cliche ways it's and, and yeah. seeking that connection to truth, the truth about what reality is and the way that feels natural in you something. Cause we've like, again, back to that car metaphor, like we've evolved to be this way. So you tap yes. into that. And you get out of your your comfortable air conditioned or heated house to go out like as hard as it is, it's there's there's something really fulfilling. It's really hard to put your finger on it. I think that's why it's it's like maybe um, a lot of people aren't doing it. Um, but when you get out there, you 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 get it. It's it's really cool that you sought that out. That you had the wherewithal to go. All right, I need to see because I think a lot of people have the same kind of things you do, and they go, but that's too difficult. That's too crazy. Mm -hmm. That's too uncomfortable. <laughs> so they don't, and they stay in there. And you had something in you that said, like, no, I'm gonna do this as uncomfortable and and out of my kind of wheelhouse as it is. I'm gonna do it. And I I, I wish that we could um we could jar that and 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 give it to more young people. Like, is there any advice that you would give for to someone who's feeling lost and unconnected with the world, which is really easy to be unconnected with the world yes. right now for like baby steps to take, to kind of lead them down a path that is really fulfilling. Cause you seem to have a really fulfilling life, which yeah. is beautiful to see. And like, how do you, I want more people to have that. So do you have like any tips for like how to kind of get them there? You know, I think there is a lot of hope in understanding that you have a place in the cycles of nature, that you are not disconnected from this thing that wrought you, and you are in constant conversation with it. And I think that conversation can be as simple as going out and sitting on a tree, sitting on grass. And these things regulate our nervous system, right? You mentioned Andrew Huberman. When we hear birdsong, our parasympathetic nervous system, our rest and digest comes on online because it's indicative that there are no predators in our immediate environment and the ancient hardware in our bodies responds to that when we go from foveated vision which we're in all day looking at our computers and our phones into panoramic vision our parasympathetic nervous system activates during that time because that's part of looking out at vistas that we would have sought out that all animals seek out in order to identify that they're safe that nothing is coming and so so much of our biology is governed by nature and so it can really be as simple as getting back into that space and feeling that sense of connection but i honestly think that connecting with a farmer going to a farmer's market meeting a farmer and cooking a little bit of food from that farm and spending that time choosing once a week to spend that time instead of watching Netflix or whatever it is, can really help you connect in to yourself, to your community, to your family, and give you a sense of where that connection might be missing in our lives. Because sometimes we have to identify the thing first before we can really go after it. And so sit next to a tree, listen to some birds, slow down, cook an egg with your family and see how it feels and really identify like, how does this feel in my body while I'm, I'm cooking this? How does it feel in my body while I'm sitting with this tree? Yeah. And so I know that's a little like, hippy dippy, but. Yeah. Well, it, it works though. That's the thing <laughs> is like, you know, it's part of, it's like opening up your eyes a little bit, paying attention. It's not a, it's not a time thing. People are like, I don't have time to cook. It's like, that's a priority thing. Because yes. how, you know, people binge watch tons of television. They exactly. do so much nonsense. They scroll for hours. It's a priority thing. And if you don't shift your priorities, then how can you expect to change anything? If you're doing great and you're feeling great and happy and all that kind of stuff with your lifestyle, cool. But a lot of people aren't. 
And if you're not, you got to make some changes and even just easing in that direction, you know, yeah, get in touch with like a local book, butcher shop instead of just going to the, to the big grocery store and getting nuggets and highly processed stuff, like give it a shot. Cause if you don't make a change in, in even these smaller ways, then you you know, the definition of insanity, right? Then nothing is going to change and you're going to stay there. It's going to get worse and worse and worse. You're going to keep getting more unhealthy. And, and I, it's just like, what I just, I think that this is, this is something that you have to just make a decision to do the same way. It's just like, I'm going to make a decision to, you know, whatever it is, like, um, look at Goggins. Yeah. Whatever it is. Yeah. Like it just has to be a conscious choice that I'm going to try and go out and, and do this. Yeah, I think it's so important. And I think you touch on something, we just have to try, right? And when we talked about building an alternative, more regenerative agricultural system, we have to try. And we just want to skip a step, right? Like we just want to jump into cultured meat or lab grown meat, instead of even trying this. And so I would tell people, you know, give it a shot, give it a try. What do you have to lose? Yeah. So do you, so what could people do other than, so we gave a couple of, but like, you know, like go meet a farmer, go to local farmer's market and stuff like that. But what else can people do to kind of start down this path? Because you're, you're hardcore now, Kate, like, but I'm sure it was a long process over many years of learning like this and getting things up. Like it didn't just, you didn't just jump in head first, right? Or did you? No, I jumped in head first. Did I you am really? that person. Yeah. 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 Oh, interesting. Person. So you were just like, I'm there. I'm, I'm there. I'm going to you know, give me the gun. I'm going to shoot this pig. I'm going to butcher. I'm going to yes. just go. Interesting. Yes. Within a year of eating meat again, I was doing a butcher apprenticeship and was seeking out opportunities to do on farm slaughters. Oh, I wow. I am an all in yeah. kind of wild person, but I, so. I think that really just by visiting a farm, I, I think that is one of the biggest next steps is to actually see how food, whether it's a vegetable farm or somebody mm-hmm. who's raising livestock, that is a chance for you to see your food being raised and grown and to associate it with something other than these hermetically sealed chicken nuggets in the grocery store. And how do you actually... do that? Yeah. Sorry to cut yeah. you off, but like, how do you do that? Cause how do you, how do yeah. you just call up a farm? Do you just drive up to a farm and walk up. I mean, Go to a farmer's market and ask if you can go visit. Um, yeah. You can use, I, I even have a farm finder. It's called Near Home. And uh, we can get a link for that in the show notes. Yeah. And you can email the farm and say, hey, can I come down? A lot of farmers and ranchers have meat sales once a month where they'll kind of clean out their freezers. Great time to get something a little bit cheaper too. And this is actually one of the things I like the most about building a relationship with a farmer is that when you are buying a quarter, a half, an, or an eighth of an animal and even sharing it with a group of people, yeah. you have an opportunity to make your food cheaper and it's better. So, right. and so getting in touch with them and saying, can I come visit? And farmers welcome that. We want people to see their food system, to see how it's interacting with their environments, want to shake people's hands and build community in yeah. that sense. Yeah. And, and if so, it, yeah, if it costs yeah. a little bit more money, then you know, like again, you're, you're going to keep taking the easy way out to go for whatever's cheapest, easiest, that will get you to where you are. And many of us are not in a good place when it comes to this kind of stuff. So again, it's it's a, a it goes back to the same concept, but not always, I guess it's not always more expensive either. It's making it a priority, right? We spend about the average is about 9% of our disposable income on food here in the United States. In most of the world, that number is much more like 30%. And I think that it sometimes comes at the cost of something else, right? Like my husband and I drive two really old cars that are, are bought and paid for. I haven't gotten a new iPhone in a really long time. And that's because I'm prioritizing the money that I spend on food, which is again, you know, making this conscious effort, this conscious decision that this is what I'm going going to prioritize. I'm going to prioritize cooking. I'm going to prioritize spending a little bit more money on food. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Um, I, I've, you know, been following you for a while, but this is a great conversation. You're a really impressive person. And like, I hope that people are that means inspired a, lot a little bit. How's that? That means a lot coming from you. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I mean, you, 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 you're doing it and you're doing something that's like, it hits on all levels for like health. It's like moral you know, ethical. It's like, you're trying to, and also you're trying to scale. You're not just keeping it to yourself. You're, you're putting a lot of effort into your podcast and everything like that to try and get the message out. That's why I'm so happy to bring you here and may hopefully introduce you to a new audience. Where can people keep up with you? 
find your podcast, find your stuff. Like, where are you on social media and everything? Cause, uh, yeah. I think seeing here's, 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 here's the thing with you, Kate. like when, when I scroll and I see you on there, I go, it makes me go like, Oh yeah, I should, you know, talk to my friends about getting another, you know, half a cow or something like that. Or, Oh, I should probably, you know, look into going like it, it, it takes you out of your, your like hypnosis of just like the daily life of like, Oh, I got it. I got carpool. And I got to take the kids to jujitsu practice. And then I got to clean, change the diaper. It, it, watching your stuff takes me out of that in a, in a really positive way. So I want people to, to get exposed because the more exposure they have to you and your yeah. podcast and the stuff that you're doing, then the more it's going to be uh, like an itch in their brain of like, okay, maybe I will try something a little different today. Wow. Thanks, Will. Uh, you can find me. So I am mostly on my podcast, which is called Mind, Body, and Soil. And we do deep dives. And I put usually 20 hours of background into every episode. And we explore themes like death, regenerative agriculture, connection, and uh, a whole host of things. And I, I think it's pretty fun. And a lot of effort has gone into that. You can find me on Instagram at Kate underscore Kavanaugh. That's K-A-T-E underscore K-A-V-A-N-A-U-G-H. You can find a farmer at nearhome.groundworkcollective.com. And I'll send you all of these links too. Yeah, yeah we'll have and them in the show notes. That's sure. mostly where I am. I'm on Twitter, but I don't, I don't, I'm not short form. I'm really yeah. long form. The podcast is long form. I have troubles distilling it into those tiny sound bites. Same. Yeah. That's why you and I are like, you know, <laughs> yeah, even our, right. in our own separate little worlds. Like that's, 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 I think something that we have in common. It seems like the people who are willing to come and talk to me are, are willing to flush out that nuance. And they're not scared of like questions or pushback or anything like that. Mm, that's the good you know? stuff. Cause it's like, yeah, that's how we get to where we're how at. How we work it out. And it's how we yeah. make it stronger. It's how we make yeah. it less fragile because I really think, you know, there's this gentleman named Dr. Bill Sh Schindler, and he looks at what it means to eat like a human from the archaeological record. And we're combining one of the most fragile species, right? Like we don't have big claws, big teeth. We don't have a lot of fur. Mm. Humans are kind of fragile. They depend on technology and that technology being, you know, breaking two rocks together and making a knife in order to hunt or fermenting their food, right? These kinds of technologies, not like an iPhone. They depend on technology to move through the world. And we're combining that with agriculture, which is an incredibly fragile system. And so part of getting some pushback here is to build more resilient, more regenerative systems above ground and below. Yeah. So many possibilities. If we really commit to trying to solve this problem and get it done right, we can. We yes. just have to be willing to do it. And it comes in an individual of saying like, all right, I'm going to make small changes in my life. And then eventually the market will be there. And then eventually that's, that's how you take down Goliath is, you yes. know, in enough courageous little Davids <laughs> to, to, to say, I'm going to do something different. And then, and then things will change. Yeah, yes, absolutely. Eyes. And yeah. I think we have agency. And I think that when you start eating this way, when you start participating in an alternative system, you feel a sense of agency that is really important in many ways to, I think, our mental health and that aspect of hope when we have agency for, oh, I'm a part of this change. I am a part of the system. I am a part of keeping my body and my family healthy. That is yeah. important. Yeah. If not for you, like then maybe for you know, the next generation, for your kids or something like you got, you know, yes. stop feeding them this garbage, stop like disconnecting them from the realities of the world. You're not serving them. So even if it's not just for you, you know, you, you have a responsibility to yes. others in the world. So yeah, I really appreciate this conversation. Kay. What you're doing is amazing. Um, keep it up uh, for whatever, <laughs> whatever that, Thank that, you. that encouraging means coming from me, but, uh, but I love it. I, I really, I love what you're doing. I, and I think it's really, really important. And I, I hope you're right. I hope you're right that we can scale this and, and do it right. Uh, I just have to be, and it's, it's a good reminder for me to, to get on it as well. So uh, yeah, I'll be well, better. Perfect. As well. Thank yeah. you so much for all of this. You know, it's an honor for me to be here. I love what you're doing in the world. You are helping, you are helping move these changes too. So thank you. Really appreciate it, Kate. All right. Take care. If you enjoy these kinds of complex conversations and want to try to apply them in your own life, check out my free download, Debate to Dialogue, a guide on having productive conversations on religion and politics. It's available at www.cylinderradio.com slash debate to dialogue.